let's get started. First session of the day. And uh, I'll just uh, give it to Alexander immediately. So let's welcome Alexander Bersniak from Ubisoft uh, Toronto. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Alexander Bersniak, Ubisoft Toronto. I'm here today to talk about the tech that I've named them IK Rig. And I was asked to start with a little bio on the speaker, so I did a little research. I went to the website, outdated, Twitter is mute, uh, YouTube channel was interesting, and finally I visited my LinkedIn page. And I found out that I'm 12 years in the industry, started in Ukrainian outsourcing company, and then worked as model artist, texture artist, sculptor, of level designer, mocap actor, rigger, animator, particle artist, shader artist. <sighs> Shipped a bunch of projects for a bunch of platforms. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Today, I'm technical art director of Ubisoft Toronto. Past two years working on something undisclosed. Now, before we begin, I want to make a couple disclaimers. Uh, first of all, all the content that I show today was made specifically for you guys to see. That's fresh, new, and just for you. Uh, my project is unannounced yet, so I'm not allowed to spill any runtime footage. Uh, but instead, I want to focus on the principles of the tech, of the idea. I want to explain how it works, uh, how it affects the pipeline, and how you guys can take it out and try it at home. Uh, as I demonstrate different aspects of the tech, uh, along with different applications of it, I'll show a number of things which are intentionally exaggerated. So, for example, if I tell you you can take a human motion and take it to the octopus riding a bicycle, I will actually mean it, I will actually show it, and it will demonstrate a certain solution. Uh, doesn't mean that whenever you need an octopus riding a bicycle, you need IK rig. You can just get an octopus, take him to mocap studio, do just that. But um, what I want to show is something specific about specific part of taking animation from character A to character B. And uh, this guy, he writes for glory, but he will also help me talk about quadrupeds later on. Third final disclaimer. Whatever you see here today is not connected to specific particular titles, okay? Uh, we are currently evaluating the application of this tag. We're seeing how far can we take it, how to adjust it for different purposes, and uh, I can't talk about specific titles today. Everything will be revealed in due time in appropriate fashion. So today we are generic. Uh, story begins, Ubisoft Toronto starts a new project. Ubisoft being Ubisoft uh, wants this project to be something special, something unique, do something that wasn't done before, um, and creative artistic people of Ubisoft Toronto being creative artistic, come up with crazy ideas that you can't really do with existing tech. So we come up with crazy tech, that's fine. Uh, our goal was uh, innovate animation through technology. It's not as boring as it sounds, actually quite fun at the end. And uh, one of the techs that we've developed is called Motion Fields. Uh, there will be a talk by Michael Butner later today. There will be a talk by Simon Clavier later today. Go there, hear them out. Another tech was called the IK Rig. So what does it do? Uh, IK Rig is a tech developed to let us do more with motion capture. Uh, first thing is we unbind the rig and the animations. So any animation can be played on any rig at runtime. Uh, so it's a unified language sort of a thing uh, that lets those different guys talk together and share stuff. Uh, secondly, we move away from animating the keyframes. We're not doing it anymore. We are animating the animations. Uh, I will showcase on direct mocap. I will also showcase on animated clips. And uh, one more thing that IQ Rig is designed for, artist is just one party influencing the motion of the character. Another party is the engine. Uh, the game environment feeding you information about the uneven terrain, object interaction, and everything else. So it's two things working together, artist and the engine. Uh, so, in the development of the tech, it was quickly apparent that uh, there are many ways to use it for many different things. So, current tech is multi-purpose. 
some of these purposes we are not even aware yet of. Uh, and in fact, I believe this tag can and should be used for any game that has characters, except maybe some cases when we don't have limbs, but uh, if you change the art style, it still works. Boring slide, important slide. In a nutshell, uh, IK Rig is a text solution for converting animation on any rig into a set of IK chains. And application of context-aware adjustments to the IK chains, and conversion of this result to any other rig, be it offline or runtime. So you have your source, your mocap rig. Uh, you map it to the IK rig unified structure. Uh, using this mapping, uh, all the animations made for this rig will be converted to IK rig animation format. And then whatever other rig was mapped to this unified IK rig structure will be able to receive these animations. It's a precise yet simple structure. It's easy to modify parameters of what happens during animations. And uh, you can modify them either offline or runtime, as I said before. And uh, these changes are stored as sets of rules. So for example, I create a set of rules to turn male walk into female walk. And that's rule number one. I make another rule that teaches the character to crouch, rule number two. I make a third rule that teaches the character to aim a weapon, rule number three. The cool part is uh, I can play them simultaneously on top of one another. So I can now get a crouching, aiming female character from a male walk. So the concept is super simple. It's not super new. We're just doing it better now. We're doing it runtime. Uh, if we look at a casual rig of game character, there are active bones, there are things like twist bones, uh, there are object bones for fingers, face, uh, constrained secondary animation bones for muscles and soft deformation, uh, nodes for world orientation, pivot, whatever else, uh, nodes placement of props on the character. It's like a lot. And uh, we don't need to animate all of them to store our uh, uh, to animate all of them in the keyframes, right? Uh, in most cases, the minimal number of the bones that we actually need to animate is about 30. Or, as in our case, uh, a set of five IK chains plus the constrained bones on the character. Uh, so, let's say you've decided that your barbarian needs an extra twist bone in his upper hand. Uh, you add this bone in your 3D software, you weight the vertices to it, of course you do that, uh, then you throw it to the IK rig, and within the IK rig structure, you define this new object as a twist bone. You assign it a twist constraint. And the cool part is, all your animations are played instantly. Like, you don't need to re import anything, retarget anything. You instantly go into the game and see this bone working. If you don't like it, you change the, uh, how much motion it gets, and you see your result once again instantly. Uh, another example adding a tail or set of extra hands on a character. Uh, you don't have to animate them, right? Uh, the tail can have constraints or physics applied to it. Extra hands can inherit the motion from the base set of hands. Now, of course, when we do a character like this, we want to hand animate certain parts of him, but we don't have to animate all the animations of the game. We don't have to recreate all the locomotions, everything else. Um, yeah, let's... Take a look at a simple example, the leg, three bones. Uh, some of the problems we face, uh, first of all, are secondary animations, not shown the secondary animation bones here, but often I saw them baked, uh, and it's not a cool thing because, yeah, that kind of works when you blend things, but if your uh, animation is controlled at runtime by um, Ragdoll, for example, or IK solution, your biceps don't work anymore because there's no baked data for them. Uh, second problem is, well, we take a character and we have just this bunch of transforms, position rotations for each bone, and they don't really tell us much. We can use positions to kind of figure out the collisions, uh, we can limit the rotations, but it's just a bunch of numbers and there's a lot, because there's a lot of bones. Uh, finally, most importantly, uh, rigs and animations very often bound together. And we're trying to figure out a way to share animation between different rigs. 
has its own problems. Um, God forbid you want this leg to become a chicken leg, especially if you have a thousand animations for it, you're screwed. So simple fact is uh, you only need a couple things to animate it. Uh, start position, finish position, rotation, and direction of the whole thing. Uh, yeah, I presume the, uh, the limb is planar in this case, but it doesn't have to be. Um, extra bones within the IK rig idea are added inside uh, the engine and constrained inside the engine. Bones for fingers, muscles, everything else. And uh, we can change this rig at any moment and any rig will play any animation. So we can have some fun with this now. And that's one animation. And this animation is not modified for any of those legs, apparently. And I mean, it's stupid, simple retargeting. Um, uh, we just have the start and target again, direction again, and we defined that the angles must be 50-50%. We can make it 80-20 any moment. All animations will still play. Uh, case of green lag, the harmonica thing, just some negative angles thrown in. And this behavior will be active for all the animations that we use. Uh, the purple tentacle thing just has m more bones, but the basic idea is the same as for the yellow leg. There's a distribution of uh, weights for the angles. And uh, the cool stuff that we also can do is when we just go away from rotating and start adding things like look at constraint and position constraint to get the telescopic motion, can do that. Uh, I'll quickly go through the most common constraints. I know half the audience knows them. But I just want to list it because it's going to be useful for us going forward. I want to make sure everybody knows about this stuff. So uh, position constraint is especially cool when you have multiple parents. So if I have my cowboy, I have one node on his holster, another node moving with his, with his hand. If I constrain uh, the position between these two nodes, I can actually drive his hand to rest on the holster anytime I want. Uh, orientation constraint, also cool with multiple parents. Good example is the tail, when you can inherit some motion from thighs and uh, hips. Uh, look at, uh, one of my favorite things to do, to not to bake, uh, because basically you want your character to look at things in the game, not just stare into the vast emptiness as he was mo capped especially in the conversations. Uh, we're also using look at uh, always for aiming in the games, right? Uh, spring, that's the secondary motion stuff. Uh, just adding a little, extra, a little extra detail to our animation. Uh, tremble or sign of time or sign of any other incoming parameter from the game lets us uh, create some procedural reaction to things that are happening. Uh, finally, driver and driven. Uh, the idea is that we link one parameter of bone A to another parameter of bone B. So, for example, the position of uh, the box changes the rotation of uh, the fingers. I don't always like to animate the fingers this way. In case they were not mo capped and we want to have some secondary motion, we can usually constrain them to forearm to do this. Um, for fingers, maybe you just want to use several preset positions that you lurk between. But that's, uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, finally, I really like to add constraints, to add secondary constraints. So um, that also works for the physics trick. So we have the maximum angle that we can turn our hands, feet, and everything else. But if we're really cool about it, we are adding the optimal angle as well. For humans, it's usually the fetus pose. What it means is the resistance will grow as your limb moves away to the maximum. So instead of just having your ragdoll going instantly to the max poses, it will be slowed down. Uh, instead of having uh, any sort of procedural solution, moving things way too far unnaturally, uh, you would actually have a nice resistance growing the closer they are, uh, to the limit. Uh, finally, one more thing that we are adding here when we define the character is uh, muscle strength. And I'll get back to this in just a moment. So all in all, uh, usually we don't use all of these constraints in any character in the game. Uh, over-constrained case like this, 
Uh, we don't usually do that. It's just too much calculation and nobody will see it. In here, the actual animation of the character is like 5% of all the stuff moving. So to recap the pipeline, right? Uh, we start by importing uh, the skinned mesh, setting the IK rig definition, what's what, simple retargeting thing. Uh, we state which bones correspond to which nodes. We add the extra bones, add the constraints to them. And uh, this definition is good enough, but we want more than simply sharing the animation. We want to do something cool with it. And uh, on the left, we see the original animation, that direct mocap thing, as it runs on 35 bones. On the right, we see the same animation, uh, just in IK rib definition, running on five IK chains plus the constraints. Uh, they're not different, and they should not be. Uh, one thing I need to explain here before I proceed. Uh, as I've said before, uh, IK rig can be implemented offline or at runtime. Uh, what happens really is that once we've defined the rig and got some animations for it, uh, we can now start changing node behaviors over the plane animations. Uh, so we can get the incoming animation from a mocap in case of offline, and then IK rig is just a set of scripts in Max or Maya or wherever. Or what is more cool, uh, IK rig can work on incoming result of the blend machine or what motion fields outputs. So now that we have the base animation unchanged yet, let's start changing it. At this stage, it's really a good idea to get an artist to your technical side. And in my case, I've been picking the brain of Christian Zadzuk, the animation director of Ubisoft Toronto, and he will join us for a couple of next fights. Okay. That's uh, the replica of my very first prototype about six months ago. It sucks. And uh, what I did, I basically just added springs to every single IK rig node. And he, he became this. Now, uh, the artistic response was that uh, too much motion is not necessarily a good thing. At least that's how I politely paraphrase the actual response I got. Uh, the cool part is that I can control the intensity of each of those things. I can tone them down globally for the character or partially for parts of the character. Uh, I can also instantly notice that I started getting some hyperextensions and I could add a rule to fix the hyperextensions so the closer it gets to being hyperextended, the stronger the force pulling it back. And this rule can be applied to all other animations that I do in the future. Uh, I moved on to experimenting with options that have a practical use. In this case, it's a floating target. I basically moved the uh, targets for hands above the shoulders, added some springs for secondary motion, and uh, we'll kind of see something happening in there. Uh, kept experimenting. And um, the fixed point, point node, uh, pretty much like the previous example, but we fixed the hands in front of the character now. Uh, of course, move a little the spine, move the head down and uh, things were getting a little more interesting at this point. So why not carry objects if we can have a fixed and floating points as targets? And the instant you start carrying objects, you go, well, maybe I can change the weight, like dynamically, why not? And uh, with the change of weight, I will change the way I carry it. Now, there are two ways to do it. You create either two boundary sets uh, of rules, like carry the super heavy, carry the super light, or you use the weight float as uh, an input in your rule, which basically will mean you're not just limited to work between A and B. You're using it, and if um, you're using it to drive the targets. So if this object will be heavier on the right or heavier on the left, or even if you're carrying a plate with an apple, which changes dynamically, that will dynamically affect your animation. And uh, that impressed Christian, not only him, we moved on. And, uh, <laughs> huh? Okay, I was afraid Obama just hung it. Uh, the real game changer happened when we started working the legs. That changes the motion completely, right? And in this case, uh, I used the target, the, the original knee position as the target for the left foot. I constrained the crutch 
to where the foot was, just a little outside, made a look at to under armpit, moved the armpit up, fixed the hand, added a little swing to the right hand, if you're still following, that gets you this. And the cool part is, um, because for the crutch, I used the position where the leg was, I don't even need to detect collisions. Because I know, or I hope, my actor did not walk through the floor, I will simply connect with it. <sighs> yeah. That's what I was working for. And uh, as I said before, the rules we create can be shared. They also can be animated. Now, this is not how a character walks and claps. This looks ridiculous and stupid. He is monotonous. He's clapping to his footsteps instead of to sign of time or something. He's not moving his spine. This really, really sucks. And that's not me, that's what Christian was saying about this. But the cool part about this artistic feedback is all of this artistic feedback I can translate to math, right? All of this, the way he talks to his artist, can be translated to mathematical rules and applied to this, to fix it. And uh, a good animation lead knows how to give feedback to artists. Artists, whether they know it or not, they actually work in semi-procedural sort of way on things like this. Um, yep. So getting back to the video we started from. Uh, now you can kind of deduce what happened where. This is just the base animation played on a different rig. Uh, so the idea is that if the character is super big and you play the, the animation from the character, he will basically just follow in the footsteps, walk in small steps. That doesn't quite cut it. So uh, the solution in this case is we scale the rig, but we scale the whole animation proportionally to the change of the level. So we scale the whole animation he starts moving in the proper positions, and we scale back whatever else uh, we need to scale back. So our whole animation changed, of course, that led to a change of the speed of the character. And he will still look plausibly, but the giant guy will now look, uh, walk way faster than the short guy. As I said, scale the legs, scale the rig, scale the animation, unscale whatever you want unscaled. And, uh, the next thing that I did, I, I played a little with cartoony characters. And can you, can you like just imagine, I don't have a picture for it, imagine the uncanny valley, right? And there is the middle spot, and I hit it. Exactly. The thing is that cartoon characters, they're not physical creatures. They don't follow the physical laws. My original mocap actor, of course, was a physical creature. So that was an interesting experiment, uh, but the result is, of course, uncanny. But cartoon is not all. There is a bunch of characters that you can't mocap, but that still need to behave realistically. And uh, I, I never seen the actual dinosaur mocap. They're too big to fit. But I have worked on creating keyframe animations for dinosaurs. And <laughs> it's actually a very good idea to watch an artist create an animation for a character when you're working on him, because. What artists do without realizing that, artists work procedurally. They place footsteps, then they animate the, uh, the pelvis, the hips, to move the weight. I actually sucked. I totally missed the hips on this one. But they move it, then they move everything else. They move the head looks forward for a wizard, the tail looks backward. There's no dynamics. I'm just taking his direction. I know where he's going. Uh. Uh, one more thing that needs to happen on the stage where you're working with unhuman characters is the step curve. So far, we're just using the step curve of the mocap actor, and the human walking on a plane actually keeps his feet very low, and that sucks. So I will talk about the step curve in just a few minutes. So I talked about the general principles. Uh, now I will talk about practice, uh, practical applications. Uh, and the thing I want to start with is called character classes. Now, the thing is that for quite a while, our games have only one character or one rig. And in every game, there is a need for character variety. And we used to do this through models and textures 
oversizing the model, downsizing the model. Recently, we started saying, OK, we're going to have a male and female rig. Still sucks, because all your males, all your females, still are the same within their group. Amazon and her grandmother share the rig and share a lot of animations. Barbarian and Shaman share the rig, share a lot of animations. So yeah, of course, we can say that, OK, for these guys, we're going to make a special uh, loop uh, of walk. So they will walk differently. Somebody's going to have this variation of walk and this variation of walk. But they're still the same in essence. Uh, and of course, yeah, uh, since the rigs used to be often tied, no, not for everybody, but I'm talking about the general thing, uh, they used to be tied for, uh, with animations. You want to start doing something new, you have to go into mocap room and you have to mocap it. And then you have to mocap it for every character that you have. That's why we keep the number of rigs so small. Because we don't want to, like, I want to open doors. I mock up one door opening animation for every single character. And my, all my doors in my game are going to be this size with the handle in here, because that's what I've got. So one of the goals that I was setting for myself uh, was to have one rig per character in the game. And uh, find a way to let animators play with it and adjust its animations. So in case of character rules, character class rules of IK rig, uh, modifications are applied on top of everything else. So I have rules for crouching, aiming, blah, blah, blah. And then I throw in the character rules saying, this guy is actually a hero, so he's going to be like this. Um, yeah, the female character in turn, I executed it, of course. Um, elbows in, hip swing. Uh, in this case, the best way to check if you're getting somewhere is look for male reactions. Uh, not here, though. Uh, creep zombie is, once again, super exaggerated. Um, spine, leg bending, footsteps still the same. Uh, for brute characters, and I know we sometimes used to introduce a special rig just for the super bulky guys. Uh, he wants to be to keep things out a little because we know that his mesh is going to be fat. But so far, all of this is the same rig, right? It's not super new. You're looking at me going, well, it's just basically targeting, yeah. The thing is that we're doing it runtime and we can mix these rules. I can make female zombie now without re-exporting any animations. Uh, actually, I just need okay, animated and I apply this stuff properly tuned, presumably, to produce everything else. Uh, but of course, as I said, if we have a rig per character, because that's what IK rig lets us do, we can get something looking like Crash. Yes? No. OK, good. And um, usually for a realistic game, we would not have such a huge changes in proportions. Uh, we would have them subtler. Now, uh, for characters, we can, of course, create the uh, rules of character class manually. We can blend between them. But there's something else I want to, uh, some another option. And uh, oh, yeah, I had a click in here. OK. <sighs> this is the type feature, uh, something we call the motion DNA. We're still testing it. The concept is you get the guy in a mocap suit, throw him into the mocap stage, let him walk around for, I don't know, half an hour. You're not mocapping him doing anything specific. You're mocapping him as he is. And now somebody is like that, and somebody is like that, and somebody has a wider swing of his hands, and somebody lifts his leg higher, and somebody keeps his head down, and somebody doesn't. But the thing is that you can parameterize this motion, and you can store it. And just from having this guy walk for 30 minutes, I store these parameters, I apply it to the character in the game, and now I have a character who will play all the animations resembling this guy. This will not be the quality of mocapping the whole thing. But it lets me have as many options as I want, lets me cross-blend between them. Let's talk about a different type of modification, uh, prop operation. Imagine we have a shooting game with multiple weapons. Um, but of course, we also, we don't just carry them, we aim them, we crouch, we reload, we shoot. 
since we have to mocap everything, we say, okay, we, if we have four weapons, we're going to have four weapon classes. So for my AK and uh, AK-47 and my M16, I'm going to share the same weapon class. So I'm going to move their handles a little bit so they will coincide. My character will grab them. I mocap this. I mocap it, mocap it crouching, walking, reloading, uh, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I, I have animation for this thing. Uh, should I want to throw in a new weapon, I either go to mocap studio again, or I fit this weapon to one of the cases that we have already. And then you remember that you do it for several characters, males, females, brutes, whatever, and for each of them. But uh, in the IK rig setting, it's the floating fixed point that we started with, right? It's not that different. And also, if we throw in things like weight, and remember I talked about the muscle strength, we're going to get a different behavior for different characters. So. If the weapon is heavy, it's going to bring the character down. If the character is your grandmother, she will not carry the RPG the same way that you would do in the game. And it's the same animation. You guys are just based on your properties. The rule set itself is very simple in here. Fixed points, uh, no targets even here. So if I want to start aiming these weapons, I take the existing rule, which already contains all the things about weapon weight and how I carry it, and they change the way I carry it to produce this, and it will work with all my other rules, and I can make it a zombie carrying something, or zombie female carrying a shield and a sword. Should we want to add a new weapon, we just make a new IK rule set. We don't change animations. So, which brings us to navigation mode discussion. Um, imagine we want the character to crouch while strafing, aiming the gun in right hand, carrying the shield in the left hand, limping on the right leg on uneven terrain, and the character is female. Now, it's not me being against females. What I'm saying is we usually mocap a male guy and then we retard, and that hurts a lot. Um, so what usually happens is we mocap walk, we mocap crouch, we use some sort of IK solution to aim the gun. Um, okay, we mocap carrying off the shield, but at a certain point we go, you know what? We're not gonna do this, okay? Uh, we will not crouch with shields. We will only limp when we walk. We will have a limping cycle, okay, and that's it. Will not limp when you crouch, will not limp when you run. And uh, females will not carry guns, so some things will be character specific because we only captured for one character. We don't want to retarget and maintain. Uh, this is four minutes. I love the. But it's super fast. And the thing is, in four minutes, my game designer goes into the level and he can crouch any character. Then, any point of time in the future, you revisit it. You have an artist standing near you. You start applying, adding changes to the way that the character crouches. You just change the rule. All the animations still. Your result instantly playable. And then, yeah, you, you plug it with the weapon on female, on uneven terrain, add the limping. See how they work. They will probably mess up horribly the first time you plug them together. That's normal. You know where to fix them. You, you can always just visit it and fix it in a specific rule set. But uh, before we go on, I want to talk about an ancient evil that we take for granted. And uh, this is called locomotion modes. We do so many things. We have weapons, we cover, we load, we aim, shoot, that we limit the type. We either do A or B. So you walk or you run because that's what we mocap. Or maybe you, you, you mocap the walk or jog or run. And there is a bunch of brilliant people figuring out a way to blend between these things. So you would not have jumps. 
Uh, we also we say you can stand or crouch, or you can stand or crouch or prone, but uh, uh, there is also a bunch of brilliant people working on a way to properly blend this. But the thing is, they are hiding the problem instead of fixing it. The problem is humans are not, <laughs> humans are not uh, integers, float between this. And um, sophistic blends, yeah, as I said, they, they are just masking the problem. And um, that limits our game design. That limits the way we play. We are used to this. Of course, yeah, I'm going to tell you there's something wrong with it, right? There's nothing. It works. In fact, it works for past 30 years. We can keep doing that. We can. And what's worse is we have to build our levels with this in mind. Uh, your doors must have fixed width, or the character won't be able to open them plausibly. Your obstacles must have a fixed height, or the character won't be able to duck under them plausibly. Your props must have fixed height because the character needs to step over them plausibly. What happens if it's a little too low? We just say, okay, we're going to clip a little. You know? I can't just have the level made of boxes like this. I need to have some variety, versatility. So we're going to clear if we're going to be OK with that. If there is a dynamic collision, OK, I'm going to clip. If there's something like this, all right. What can you do, like literally? The fluent motion is based on ray tracing forward. I know how we like to ray trace. And uh, we trace not in. Not in time, we trace in space. So the thing is, we predict what's going to happen, and we start part by part affecting the character. So we only go as far as we have to in each particular case. We never switch from state to state. There are no states here. This is the fluent change in the character, in the rule. Um, humans. We, we ray trace in our life, right? We, we don't collide by choice. We usually, when we collide with something, it's not, not something we wanted to do, it's something we didn't see coming. So uh, the collision is bigger, and we try to avoid more. So I started throwing in the uneven terrain just for the kicks in here, and yeah, that's alpha. But the whole concept of metrics for the levels is ridiculous. We invented it because we had to figure a way to, to move through this stuff. We did a smart thing. It's just, it's 2015. We can invent something new. I'm not saying it's going to be Icaric. There's a bunch of great stuff that uh, Natural Motion does or what guys at Destiny did. Uh, it's time to move from it. And um, I know that the questions that appear are like, well, I'm so used to have a crouch button on my controller. A game designer would say, you know, I'm used to design like this. A level designer used to say, well, my level is usually built from blocks. Do I have to have these soft, non-uniform things now? Well, you can. You don't have to. You can still have crouch. Or you can figure out a way that, OK, I'm going to uh, make my character go lower the longer I press the button. I don't know. It's, it's up to them to figure. What I'm saying is uh, the guy breaks a leg, goes into hospital, stays there for two months, gets out, gets a crutch, walks with a crutch for six months, then he's physically restored. He throws the crutch away, and he keeps limping, because he's used to that. It's his choice. The uneven terrain, latest development, the most <sighs> roughest one at the moment. Uh, let me mention that for this demo, one thing I'm not doing is time warps. Usually, you would have a character going up or down, he would go down. I'm not doing this in here. I know I'm aware that takes the realism down, whatever I had in there. But um, I just want the pace to be continuous between the several examples that I'm going to show. Uh, what we usually do, we trace down and we lift the character based on where the ground is, right? So the simplest rule that I can create, the brute force, just that. So th this character is not aware of anything. It's, he's just aware of how high he's lifted. If we want to add reaction 
to whether he's going up or down, based again on simple ray tracing, we have a more believable behavior as a result. Because he's kind of reacting to his uh, environment. Now, steep ground, we usually avoid this. Or we say, OK, I'm just going to take my pivot and move my character up and down on the slope. Nobody cares. Everybody's used to seeing this. And um, in fact, if a human, if we didn't say we're going to just fake and say it, well, I've, I would probably just start going to quadru to climb it. But I like the stress test, because if I use the same rule that I just showed you guys on this, I'm going to see that it still kind of works. And what I take out of this is when I have when I have something like that, accidental change. I know the rule will still hold. Uh, side tilting, something we usually ignore. So if there's a tilted terrain up to a certain point, we only care if we're walking up or down, because that's the length of our animation we saw seen from the top. But sideways, we don't care. Uh, what I like to do is, if we ray trace every foot, we start shifting the weight of the whole body. And we start trying to compensate for it, in this case, with the hands. And actually overplay it a little, because uh, this ground to us looks a, little, uh, a lot curved. The line that they're walking in the middle is actually way uh, straighter than the visual. Uh, yeah, this. Good. I'm just going to have a flat collision under it, and it's going to be fine. Because there is no IK solution that can handle this. I literally, I can't handle this as well. Especially mining that all my system is based on the guy walking on flat terrain where his feet are low. So that's where I need to do something with the foot curve. I would still hope that there is no case like this, but once again, we're testing on extreme, right? So we're going to Nostradamus it a little in the animation. And I prefer to, instead of tracing something at this particular case, I prefer to, in animation, when I import it, bake it, I store uh, how far the foot is in frames in the step and how far along in the frames till the foot is landed. I also store direction and distance to the place where the foot will land. Which means now I can draw any curve I want, and I have all the data to move this foot within the footstep on this curve. So I can have the stumping or shuffling just by changing the curve of the footstep. And I can have a different for both legs. So yeah, I, I'm still working on the whole body balance, and that's something that I actually want, I actually prefer to do a runtime thing. But uh, in this case, that's a more plausible behavior for the foot positions compared to what we started with. In famous case, discontinuous terrain. Somebody asked me about this. I hate it. The problem you know, if we just trace down, stay up, sudden change, our IK breaks. So. If we mocap this, we're going to say that on our levels, all the stairs are going to be this size, length, height. There will be no other stairs because we didn't mocap them, especially for females carrying guns, crouching. Uh, also, what happens is, well, do I mocap every possible angle walking this stair? Because if I walk it, uh, walk it at 45 degrees, that's a different animation is required. Uh, we say, OK, screw it, we're going to fake it. Foot, feet going to slide, it's OK. We probably just would have the uh, just straight collision in there. Uh, but we're tracing the footsteps in IK rig, right? So we can kind of know where the foot is going to land. Instead of just tracing down, we, we know the position that we're looking for. And maybe that can work with the stairs? with any direction, crouching. And um, in case we get somebody who's up a little, or we have the stairs which are of different size, uh, we can still work with them. Uh, so one thing that's wrong with this is, uh, as, I, as I 
foot is going to be with this curved thing, I'm actually not detecting collisions. So I'm, I'm clipping through. Now, if I wanted to detect collisions, I could do it. But in this case, I decided I'm not. And I'm still going to be OK. I'm still saying faking is good in cases where we want it. Ah, this final test of discontinuous terrain. I've seen uh, mini games built on stuff like that, when you have, especially when you have different distances between things. You mocap a special case, jumping left and right. You add magnets so the player doesn't fall off. And uh, the thing is, uh, a five-year-old would have no problem with this thing. And your hero should not have a problem with this thing. So uh, I'm 90% there. What remains is 90% of polish and actually working with artists. <sighs> a couple on quadruples. I promise to showcase this guy again. Uh, I tested the IK rig on cross species solutions, uh, taking a German Shepherd mocap, turning it into a cat. Works up to a certain point where the cat starts peeing with the leg lifted. Uh, there, was, <laughs> there was a good example uh, a mocap actor during the session, a human, uh, scratched his nose. And since I just grabbed the, the full clip, because that's what we do in motion, clip, uh, motion fields, the, the T-Rex, <sighs> I will never forget it. It did it. It involved a broken neck, and it did it. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is a cross species, I think, is a really bad idea. We can take a dog into a cat locomotion, but we need to know that uh, Every species, they have their own specific ways of doing things, uh, including the peeing of the dogs, including the way the cat moves. So we, uh, in cases where we need an elephant, we can use this solution to take a dog into elephant locomotion, but we will still rely heavily on animators working this thing. Um, okay, so the further we go, the less realism we have, as in this case. It's funny, but it's useless. Uh, I've been trying, testing, to bring a human into quadruped. Uh, my resolution is I should not be doing it. Because what happens is, um, this is actually a quadruped, like the result of it. Uh, trace forward, trace backward in the trajectory. That's where front and hind legs are. And uh, at this moment, well, that's the bicycle, right? Um, but the wheels of bicycle, they're not connected to the foot position of the actor. They turn based on the distance they cover. Uh, same would happen with a quadruped. I would have to create the new sets of footsteps, make sure they're cross-symmetrical. Because I can't use the footsteps of the middle position of the human for this. Uh, which basically means the only thing from my actor in here is his hips trajectory. And basically, that means I have to create a procedural quadruped. That's not my goal at the moment, happily. So I would say mocap dogs. Tested it on dogs, works good. Works good. Take Shepherd to Chihuahua, works good. So where I'm taking this whole thing. Uh, we have the runtime right now. Uh, now it's about expanding it, doing a lot of tests doing a crap load of artistic iterations. Because, yeah, on these like cartoony characters, it all looks kind of fun and interesting. If we go to realistic characters, you can see that something is off. There is a lot of polish to be done. Uh, there's yet another big thing ahead, explore. Figure out what else can be done that we did not think of. We've just scratched the surface of uh, the possible applications, and uh, we have big plans. A lot of experiments ahead, which brings me to the announcement. Um, I'm looking for crazy tasks for the system. Uh, I'm open for suggestions. If you want to see a human riding a T-Rex or T-Rex riding a human, throw it. Uh, have my contacts. Suggest it. Uh, I intend to, well, I will release all the videos as soon as you guys are okay with this. Uh, but then uh, I intend to release one test a week, showcase the progress of the tech. Maybe at some point I'm going to say I give up and screw it, but for now, I'm totally for it. Uh, couple 
credit due. First, the blue guy. Without him, there would be nothing else. Uh, and of course, the actor, Christian, our animation director, who is a lot of help. And uh, Michael Butner, he will be talking. Did you turn off my microphone? No? OK, thank you. Uh, visit him. He's got a bright mind, one of the brightest minds I've encountered. And get a piece of it in a motion fields talk. Go to Simon's uh, talk about uh, motion fields for honor. And my biggest thanks is to Ubisoft Studio. That's the craziest uh, family I had for a Merci. Thank you.